And now, please give it up for Charles McCaffrey. Wow, you look great from up here. I can't even see you. It's awesome. <laughs> so I dug deep into my memories of boot camp and prepared myself for the next 41 nights in jail. I remember not being scared, but I remember being afraid of appearing scared and what the consequences could be if I looked vulnerable or weak to the other inmates. So I'd gotten a high and tight. And I still maintained some semblance of military bearing, even though I had left the service two years prior. But at six foot and 200 pounds, I don't look vulnerable. In fact, just the opposite. I found out a week or so into my incarceration that most of the inmates thought I was an undercover cop. <laughs> yeah, that can go one of two ways. Uh, but fortunately, these were not hardcore felons. Like me, they were in for misdemeanors and pretty much just gave me a wide berth and left me alone, which suited me just fine. But that left me with a lot of time to think, like, how the hell did I end up here? You know, I had had a successful career in the military. I was working a, a high-paying job as a government contractor. I lived in a penthouse apartment in Reston. I was going back to school to get my MBA. I had a perfect life. And yet here I was sitting in a jail cell in Arlington, Virginia. Look, I know why I was there. I had drank too much a night out in DC, got behind the wheel of a car. Does it matter that I was going too slow on I-66? Probably the only car going too slow on I-66. <laughs> and that nobody got hurt. Sure, that's important to me, but it doesn't matter to the justice system. But how did I really get there? You know, nobody wakes up one morning and decides they want to lose everything. It happens slowly and subtly, and it builds over time. For me, it started at the funeral and spiraled downward from there. So yeah, the funeral. I was allowed to sit up front because I was friends with the family. Military funerals are a funny affair, not funny ha-ha, but funny surreal. You know, attend a funeral anywhere else in the world and there's gonna be wailing and feasts and gunfire and fireworks and celebrations and protests before lunchtime. But in America, we grieve in silence. And then people make casseroles. I hate casseroles. And at a military funeral, your brothers and sisters in arms, they stand straight in silence, stone-faced, back straight, chin out, defiant in the face of death and grief and tragedy. We don't cry in public, and I certainly didn't cry. There were no more tears left. And I wasn't just stone-faced. I was a stone. I was an inanimate object dead inside. Now, that's not true. I had disassociated myself from the situation because I knew if I thought about it for even one minute, I was going to break down bawling again. This had been going on for quite some time. I'd been going through the five stages of, of grief every couple of minutes. You know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Uh, not acceptance, not yet. See, I had seen the message traffic that reported the suicide bomber and Brent's name on the list of casualties about a week before they had notified his parents. But because it had come across on a classified network, I wasn't allowed to say anything. I never received an official notification. See, they had lost their son and I had lost my partner. But in 2004, only one of us could acknowledge our relationship and our loss, and it wasn't me. To be entirely honest, I don't know why I joined the military in the first place. I grew up in a small town in the middle of nowhere, Montana. So it's not obvious why I would join the Navy. <laughs> now granted, there was an Air Force base, so I knew I wasn't going in the Air Force. 
and my dad was in the Air National Guard. Now, three of my four older brothers, I guess, in rebellion had joined the Navy, and I remember being fascinated by the, the photographs and the souvenirs that they brought back from their travels. You know, the Mediterranean, Southeast Asia, Iceland. I know it's a cliche, but I joined the Navy to see the world. And we weren't wealthy, and there's this thing called the GI Bill, and I intended to go to college someday. But regardless of my reasons for joining the military, I knew that I wanted to be the best I could be. You know, to be a good sailor, a good technician, eventually a good and inspiring leader. But I also knew no matter how good I was, no matter how inspiring of a leader I was, no matter how many medals and, and recognitions I got, I was never gonna be good enough. Because people like me heard it all the time. You know, people like me undermine good order and discipline, and we erode unit cohesion. And we're weak, and we're girly, and we're mentally unstable. And so to serve, you take on a role. You play butch, you learn the pronoun game, you even learn how to pass a polygraph. You learn how to be not you. And that takes its toll on a person mentally and physically. And so at 40, here I was sitting in jail facing the question, how do I get back to being the person I was before the military? Back to being the carefree guy who liked to laugh and didn't know or care about being different. Now, I don't regret my military service. And certainly one of the things that, that I learned was how to keep moving forward, even though you don't necessarily know where you're going. You put one foot in front of the other. And so after my time in jail, I quit my soul-sucking government contracting job. <laughs> I finished my MBA, and I started and sold a couple of businesses. And eventually got hired at a university, which is about as far away from the military mindset as you can get. <laughs> but fate's a funny thing. Shortly after taking that job, I was asked if I would be part of a new program that was going to help transitioning service members and their families start their own small businesses. Those of us who have served, we want to continue serving. And so I said yes, even though I wasn't sure I was worthy of, of the opportunity. You know, what kind of an example was I going to be to my fellow veterans? What eventually became the Boots to Business program started off in typical government fashion. No funding, no <laughs> curriculum, and all volunteers. Uh, my first class was taught in a windowless basement classroom at Henderson Hall to six Marines. I did my best, but I wasn't sure how good the class was until one of the students uh, called me up for a follow-on counseling. Now, I remember he was the one who sat in the back and didn't say a word for two days. He had lost an arm and a leg to an IED suffered from night terrors, um, and had a very dark sense of humor and a bit of a temper. In other words, a Marine. <laughs> and I liked him. Um, you know, he didn't think that a normal nine to five job was gonna be possible or even desirable, but he didn't wanna sit around and feel sorry for himself or worse, be treated as a victim. And the thing that got me was he said that my story had inspired him. Or as he later put it, if a squid can do this, then half a Marine should be able to do it twice as well. <laughs> you know, here's the thing with entrepreneurship. It's not only a vocation, it's a mindset. You know, it doesn't matter uh, or care about your past or your disabilities or your gender identity, or your orientation, or your race, or your religion. It's about creating opportunities. It's about solving a problem. And I think that's why so many veterans gravitate towards it. And so we worked on his business plan while he prepared the transition out of the military. And when he got back to his hometown, he got a small loan and started a food truck. Today he has three food trucks and 10 employees, and they're all wounded warriors like himself. Recovery doesn't happen overnight. It starts slowly and subtly and builds over time. 
My one class of six has grown into 50 classes a year in the D.C. area to over 2,000 military service members and their families. And the Boost to Business program is taught worldwide. Service saved my life. Not my military service. That was probably the, nearly the end of me. But helping others to start a new chapter in their lives has helped me to rebuild mine. Thank you.